Um, unit six introduces you first of all to the other, the last of the three declensions of nouns. So a declension, just to remind you, is a class of nouns that have something in common in their inflectional categories. There isn't any difference in the functions of the inflectional categories. It's just a matter of the sounds, okay? So we've had all the nouns of the first declension, all mm -hmm. the nouns of the second declension, and, and then so far none of the nouns of the third declension. And the third declension is the largest and the oldest class. So it has diversity. In other words, the book does its trick of saving up the difficult stuff for later. But these aren't that difficult. Um, you'll see how it works out. Um, the, these are nouns that are either masculine or feminine and neuter, okay? And one of the features that marks their archaism is that there is no difference formally in the endings of the masculine as against the feminine. Um, they're the same to look at. Um, the neuter has the kinds of differences that we're used to. But um, what Belisi has written up so beautifully with nice color coding on the on the blackboard is the set a version of the endings of the third declension noun that is slightly and significantly different from the diagram in the book. Um, so, so I prefer that you look at this one, and I think it'll help you to understand. And I'll tell you about the differences. Okay, so what we're giving you is these are the things that make the third declension of the third declension. That is, these are the things that the nouns of the third declension has have in common. These are the endings. Okay, that's what marks them. Um, and the first problem with the third declension is that the nominative um, is not predictable anymore because the old ending of the nominative was s. All right, and I've given it there. The book book does something which I don't think is correct. It says that there is no nominative ending, which mm -hmm. isn't right. Um, it, it's it's in the masculine and feminine the nominative ending was an s but s is an unstable sound in the language so what happens is it disappears it gets coalesced coalesces with other things it means that you can't predict what the nominative is um, and for the third declension however if you get the nominative and the genitive those two things um, then you can pr predict pretty much all of the rest of the paradigm um, so when it comes to third declension nouns, those are the two things to learn. If you look them up in the dictionary and you see the way they're given in the vocabulary, you, you, you have to learn the nominative singular, whatever gender it is. Whoops. Hold on. Hold on. Right back. Just walk by it. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Belisi. You have to learn the nominative singular masculine because that's not predictable anymore from the genitive and the genitive because it's not predictable anymore from the nominative. You've learned this more or less already for the book presents the, the nouns of the first and the second declensions as though this was the case but really if you know the nominative of the first or second declension nouns and its gender then you know what class it belongs to you can do the rest of the paradigm whereas in these cases you can't. Okay so so just a word to the wise, you've got to learn nominative, genitive, and gender. Because the gender, well, for, for some of them, it's really easy to predict. For most of them, actually, right? And then, then some of them you have to, you have to, you know, you just can't tell and you have to learn. But it's not, it's not the kind of problem that it is in some languages that have grammatical gender and you, can't, you can never tell what a, any given noun will be. Yep. From the form, you can tell from many of these. All right. So, so let's get back to the list. The, the book, as I said, doesn't give you uh, uh, an ending for the nominative singular but uh, of the masculine and feminines, but it actually was an S, and the S disappears in some cases, or it appears in other cases. So it's good to know that it's there. Okay, you're going to see it. Um, the genitive ending is always os, and that's for, um, in the singular, anyway, for all nouns, whatever class they are. Um, the dative, again, for all nouns of whether, whether they're masculine or feminine or neuter, is i. The accusative singular, as you notice, we've given you two alternatives. Sometimes it's alpha, and sometimes it's nu. Um, maybe you remember that those are actually originally the same sound, okay? That is, uh, an original nu, okay, becomes an alpha in some cases. So that's why, for example, the negative prefix, which is un in English, 
as in unhappy, and in in Latin as in um, infamous, okay, um, is a in Greek as in athanatos or adikos or and so forth. Okay, the the n is is originally a vocalic n and it comes out as an alpha in in Greek. Um, but then there are some places where you actually have it as a, a new in some words, like some very old words, like the word for um, uh, sleepless in Greek is, um, well, anyway, we'll, we'll worry about these things later. But anyhow, there are places where the, you can see that. <coughs> Notice that um, in the singular, anyway, these nouns can and very often do have a separate vocative from the nominative. Not always, okay, but more often than in the than in the first and second declension nouns. Remember, in the first and second declension nouns, we only had distinctive nominatives. In the second declension nouns, we had e eh for for the nominative for the vocative singular, and and the the first declension nouns of the stratiotas stratiotes type, where you have stratiota um, as the vocative singular. Everywhere else, the nominative and the vocative are the same. So in these, we're going to learn how it works, that you have a vocative with no ending. Okay, you'll see how this works. We're going to teach you some sound rules, which will make clear the consistency of the forms. So the plural endings are, notice the nominative plural is ES, S. The genitive plural, like for all Greek nouns, is ON. The dative plural is SE. Okay, again, begins with an S, which is going to cause us some problems. Okay, you need to maintain the morpheme boundary. In other words, in order to tell that a given noun is a dative plural, you need to be able to see or hear that s, okay? But it's going to do funny things to the consonants in front of it, okay, when there are consonants. Um, and finally, as, that's an alpha there for the accusative plural for masculine and feminine nouns. The, the neuter forms are the same, except that the nominative, the accusative, and the vocative singular are all nothing. Okay, that's not a phi, that's a zero, uh, or a zero with a line through it, okay, in the nominative singular, the vocative singular, and the accusative singular. Um, otherwise, the endings are either like the, the, the uh, neuter nouns of the second declension, that is, they're alpha in the nominative and accusative and vocative plural, um, and then the genitive is own, and again, the dative plural is as in, for the masculine and feminines, it ends in si. That it can have a new movable after it. We should put that out there. Um, so it can be sin in some cases. All right. So so let's look at some examples. Um, we, we've got on our next page two, three nouns, rather. Um, we've got elpis, the word for hope or expectation. Ikes, a noun, and that's, that's he elpis. It's a feminine noun. We have ikes, which can be either masculine or feminine. It's the word for goat, so it can be either he goat or she goat, okay, <laughs> or just goat, <laughs> in which case it's masculine. And then charis, which is a really um, important cultural word in Greek. We get the English word charity from it, um, but it means a favor that you do for somebody. Um, and in the society, uh, reciprocal things, as you remember when we talked about guests and hosts and strangers, things that have to do a favor is something that you give to somebody as though you, you're doing it generously, but you know you're going to get one back, right? Mm -hmm. It's the, the overt expression of reciprocal behavior, right? I'll do you a favor means you're going to owe me one later on, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, this is a term in the reciprocal uh, vocabulary. If you think about charity, when you give charity, you're supposed to get anything back? Not physical. <laughs> you're not supposed to get anything back, but you're supposed to get prestige, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, respect. So it's not so selfless as it seems. Anyhow, <laughs> so not to be give you social commentary in the course on Greek grammar, but anyhow, this is part of the institution. So the words are there. Let's look at these forms, okay? The, 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 we're setting up a couple of things. There's a contrast in the forms of elpis and charis, but let's just look at them as examples of third declension nouns. If you see the nominative elpis, okay, um, the genitive is elpidos with a delta. And so um, you can see that 
all the other forms have the delta in it, el pidi, el pida, um, except for the vocative where there once was a delta, but no Greek words end with those consonants anymore. The deltas, the taus, the thetas, the p, beta, phi, and the kappa, gamma, phi at the ends of Greek words all disappeared. So that's why there's nothing there. Okay, the plural is el pides, el pidon, el pisi. Okay, which comes from el pid plus si. We're going to talk about that sound change, and then el pidas. So here are the endings we're talking about. You can see that el pisi, which gives you the dative plural where the delta disappears. The same thing is giving you the nominative el pid plus s. The delta disappeared, so you have only the s, right? Um, so, so there's a consistency to the sound changes here that we will we will try to teach you in a in a consistent way. The the thing that we want to stress about this is the, the, there there's an, our first example of the endings of a third declension noun and how visible they are. The fact that you need to know the nominative and the genitive, okay, and from the genitive and the nominative you can generate the rest, okay. The nominative gives you the form, in fact, that you get, see in the dative plural where there's a, the, the sound change. Okay, so that's helpful. And, um, and uh, lastly, we want to talk about um, the accusative singular. Remember in our list of the endings of the first of the third declension, the masculine and feminine ones, we have s, os, i, and either a or nu, okay, el pida has an alpha. Okay, so so let's go over to the end of the of the uh, blackboard and look at the word charis. Okay, um, that has the nu in the accusative singular. Um, so there's charis, charitas. There you can see that you have the the ending um, with a t. All right, and and charite that that's nu that tau. Okay. Um, the original, the older forms of charis don't have that t, but in in the in the accusative singular, you see the fact that this these nouns originally just ended with an i, and the accusative ending is the is the new. Okay, mm -hmm. so there are some complicated things going on with these nouns, but the book gives you a rule of thumb. What's a rule of thumb? Okay, a rule of thumb is a is a bogus kind of rule. It doesn't explain anything, but it helps you to know something. Okay, um, it's the kind of it's it's helpful, but it's it's not scientific. Okay, but let's stick with what's helpful. The rule of thumb about third declension nouns about when they have an alpha in the accusative singular and when they have no a new is this: when the iota in the inflection has an accent on it, as in elpis, you have alpha. When it doesn't have an accent, like in charis, you have a nu. It makes no sense, but it accounts for the phenomena, okay? No accent on the iota, you're going to have a nu. An accent on the iota, you will have an alpha, okay? So that's a rule of thumb. It works. We can stop there, okay? The, the, uh, we've given you the word for goat, she goat or he goat, which can be either gender, for one simple reason because of its accent. Okay, we're going to learn about noun accents. You are maybe already have by the time you're looking at this video, um, and maybe you can see what's going on, especially with these nouns. It's really clear that is the accent on the third declension nouns tries to stay where it is in the nominative singular. Okay. But in the case of the word for goat, ikes, which is a one-syllable word, something different happens. Um, and so if you look at this, you've got ikes, that has an acute accent on the alpha iota, but it moves to the last syllable in the genitive and the dative, both singular and plural. So instead of being igos, it's igos. And instead of being aige, it's aige. And, and then it goes back to aiga on the on the on the initial syllable in the accusative and in the vocative. Same is true of the plural. I guess and I guess have the accent on the first syllable, but I go on and I xi, okay, there's your there there's the, the date of plural ending, okay, have the accent on the last syllable. So um, monosyllabic nouns of the third declension, um, that's a pattern. 
So we're gonna we're gonna learn some others that do that. Um, if they if they if the nominative singular has only one syllable, the way it works is the genitive and the dative have the accent on the last syllable. The nominative and the accusative have it on the initial one. All right. All right, let's move on to the last page here, which last two pages, where, where we're teaching you some sound rules. This is one we've seen before, and we've seen it before in the context of learning how the future works. Do you remember this? So in the future, remember when the sign of the future in, in the regular verbs in Greek is the sigma, and when you add it to a noun that ends with a consonant, and these are the stop consonants in Greek, p, beta, phi, are the ones you make with your lips. Kappa, gamma, chi are the ones that you make with your soft palate. And tau, delta, theta are the ones that Greeks actually made by touching their tongue to their teeth. We don't do that in English. Um, those are the dentals, okay? And notice what happens in each case. Whether it's a P or a beta or a phi, when you add S to it, it turns into P sigma or psi. In other words, it becomes the first on in the column um, that is the you get p plus s that, that what the s does is to devoice and deaspirate. In the case of p, it doesn't change. Okay. In the case of kappa, gamma, and chi, okay, the same thing happens. It becomes ks, which we write as a c. Um, in the case of t, tau, delta, or theta, it became ts, and then it went through a bunch of changes, and it became just plain s. All right. So this helps us because the nominative singular like for the word for goat is you can see what the ending is um, in the genitive. Um, you had ikes and igos. So when you add the s to the nominative, you get the gamma becomes a, a kappa. So you get ikes. When you could see look at the date of plural and you add ig plus s, you get ikes, right? Mm -hmm. So so this is a way to remember to help you out with the fact that the S is there as a nominative ending. How come the nominatives look the way they are and how to deal with the date of plurals? We have one more chart for this problem. Um, and that is when, um, when, when the third declension nouns end with other consonants than the stop consonants, okay? Mm -hmm. And they fall into certain patterns. So the first rule says that when the, the stem of the noun, and you can see that from the genitive, okay? When the stem of the noun ends with a nu or a sigma, and you add s to it, the nu or the sigma disappears. So for example, we're going to learn the, the word for Greek in Greek. Helene, which means a Greek person. So Helene, the genitive, you can write it up there. The genitive is Helenos. Helene with an acute on the eta. Okay, that's on Not the eta. Yep. Okay. Ah. All right. Oh no, it disappeared. Helene. Okay. No, it's on the epsilon. Sorry, not on the eta. My bad. Shoot. It's not letting me do it. Okay. All right. It's on the epsilon there. So, nah. Yeah, it's a big epsilon because it's. I see what you're saying. There you go. Sorry, All right. it's not letting me do much. Here we go. You're doing fine. There, there we, go. we go. All right. So, so that's the genitive of it. Okay. In the dative, it's Helene plus C gives you Helace. The new mm -hmm. disappears and you get Helace. So that's a, a form that we're going to learn in this lesson. That means uh, Helene, which is what Greeks call themselves in the classical period, or pan Um There are also a whole bunch of of third declension nouns that end in either epsilon, nu, tau, ent, or ant, or ant. And and tau as a combination are noun formants in Greek um, in third declension nouns. So for example, Polisi's written down the noun geron, which means an old man. Okay? It's masculine. The genitive of it, why don't you put that down, Polisi, is gerontos. Okay? And the gender is masculine. So uh, when you add the s to an ONT or an ENT or an ANT, look what happens. The N and the T disappear, but you lengthen the vowel. If it's epsilon, it becomes EI. If it's alpha, it becomes long alpha. If it's omicron, it becomes OU. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's a lengthening principle that you have at a certain period in Greek. Not uh, omega 
uh, not eta, but epsilon iota for epsilon and omicron, upsilon for omicron. Okay, so if you want to learn those rules, fine, or you can just learn the native plural when you learn the nominative singular, okay? But uh, either way, it's worth getting a grip on how these sound changes happen in the third bunch of nouns. Thanks. It's Belisi and Lenny talking about relative pronouns in Unit 6. Is it 6 or 7? 6. 6. <laughs> All right. Um, this video is about how relative pronouns work in English and comparing that to how they work in Greek. Um, and we're, we're just selecting one of the relative pronouns in English. That's the relative pronoun who, which has two other forms, whose and whom. Um, just to be fair, there are other relative pronouns in English, mm -hmm. right? Like which and that, right? So we're talking about things like the book which I wrote is silly, or the person that I like is beautiful, right? Stuff like that. So that's a relative clause. It's introduced by a word like who, which, or that, and there's a sentence after it, okay? Those sentences have subjects, objects, and verbs, just like a regular sentence. But because it's the relative pronoun can't stand by itself, you can't have a sentence that I like, it has to be part of a bigger sentence, the, the person that I like, blah, blah, blah. Right? Mm -hmm. So they're dependent clauses, not independent ones. Um, and uh, we're just going to look at the ones with who, whose, and whom, because they're very interesting from the point of view of understanding the way relative pronouns work in Greek and in English. So um, in English, we have this relative pronoun who, whose, and whom, which has three different forms. And the way you use it is you choose which one of those three forms it has, depending on its grammatical function within the relative clause, okay? So our example sentence is, the chef who baked this cake messed it up, okay? In, in that sentence, who is the subject of the verb baked, okay? Um, it refers to the chef, okay, who happens to be the subject of the sentence, but if you could, you, you did it otherwise, you could say the, the cake, or, well, let's see, I, I dislike the chef who baked this cake. The who would stay the same, right? It has nothing to do with the case of the chef, mm -hmm. right? It's all about what you want to say in the relative clause. So because who is the subject there, use the form who. Let's go to the next page, okay? We got two other versions of this sentence. Oops. Um, so here's number two. The chef whose cake I ate messed it up. Now, whose is spelled in a funny way, but it's really who apostrophe s. It's the genitive of who, right? Um, so we have r remains of the inflectional system in Indo-European in the relative pronouns in English. So that's why we want to look at them. But there, that's a genitive, and it's a genitive modifying cake, right? It, it's a possessive genitive with the word cake. So it's what you want to say in that clause, whose cake I ate, that determines the form of who, right? Not the chef, right? That it refers to. And the last example is whom, which is the accusative case of who. So the chef whom I disrespected, in that case, um, messed up this cake on purpose. The whom is the object of the verb disrespected, right? So you can see you can do any of the three things that... Um, that these three case endings want, and it's all happening inside the relative clause. That's the determiner of the case of the pronoun, okay? Who, whose, or whom. All right, so now let's move on to the way it works in ancient Greek. Um, in ancient Greek, relative pronouns have, and in English, they have antecedents, okay? So we need to introduce this concept of what an antecedent is. So we defined it for you. It's for antecedents or nouns from elsewhere in the sentence or in the context sometimes that they refer to. So in our example, the chef who baked this cake messed it up. The who points back at the chef, right? Usually the antecedent comes before. That's what anti means, okay? So the antecedent of who is the chef. If we look at, um, at the way Greek um, uh, relative pronouns work, we can see that there's a, 
there's something important that happens. Because ancient Greek, ha the relative pronouns, like other words in ancient Greek, have both gender and number as well as case. In English, we only have case, who, who's, and whom. Um, and it doesn't, uh, in, in who, who's, and whom, we can't tell whether it's singular or plural. It works for both, right? The, 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 the books, the, the people whom I liked, or the men who ate the fish, okay? Mm -hmm. Those are plural forms we don't distinguish in the relative pronouns. And we don't have any grammatical gender in English anymore, okay? Um, but So in English, the case of a relative pronoun is determined only by its grammatical function in the relative clause. But its gender, uh, in the case of Greek, okay, and number are determined by the gender and number of the relative clauses, of relative pronouns antecedent. Okay, English doesn't have gender and number, Greek does, and they're used to make it possible to specify and to remove ambiguities about who the antecedent is of a relative pronoun. There are cases in English sentences where you can't tell, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, um, this is the basic idea um, that we want to get across to you about how Greek relative pronouns work. That's the fundamental rule. The case of the relative pronoun is like English, it's determined by its function within the clause. But the gender and the number are determined by the gender and the number of the antecedent. All right, we're going to have another video on the forms of the relative pronoun. That's it. So, Thony and Belisi talking about Unit 6 and Hansen and Quinn. Um, we're going to talk about the forms of the relative pronouns in Greek. Okay, so before we do, we, we give you two reassuring rules, okay, because these forms look very similar to things that you already know, namely the definite article. But here, here's the key, the key concepts. We'll come back to these after you look at them. The relative pronouns always have an H, okay, they never have a T at the beginning, and they always have an accent, both of those things. So in the article, for example, when you have an H, as in ha and he, and hoi and hi, you never have an accent. And, um, and so there's no, the, the other forms of the relative pronoun, um, the other forms of the article all have a T, and this, this word always has an H, okay? So there's no way you can confuse these two things. We, now let's look at them and so you don't freak out. You already know that they're not the same. So here are the forms of the singular, and these are not challenging. These look like the endings of what they look like. First and second attention. Adjectives, okay, except for the neuter, nominative, and accusative singular. In agathos, for example, it goes agathos, agathe, agathon, not without the nu, okay, but the pronouns have an older, older form without an ending in the neuter, okay? And uh, so the endings are, the, it's just the endings of the first and second declension adjectives, except for that thing about the neuter, with accents. Now look at the accents, okay? The accents are acute and the nominative and accusative, and circumflex and the genitive and the dative, okay? We've seen this before in one syllable, well, it's just like words that have an accent on the last syllable, effectively, has, has an accent on the last syllable, <laughs> okay? So it becomes circumflex and the genitive and the dative. If you look at the plural, which is on the next screen, uh, again the endings of the of the nominative of, of the masculine and feminine and neuter adjectives of the type agathos, completely the same, with an H and an accent, and that accent changes to a circumflex in the genitive and the dative. All right, that's okay. it. That's quick. This is still the unit six of Hansen and Quinn. We're talking about subjunctives that can be main verbs of sentences, okay? Um, and there are three kinds of sentences in which this works. Um, the first type are what are, the book calls hortatory, which is the same word as exhortation in English. Um, when you exhort somebody to do something, and in this case, it's you and you, the speaker, and someone else, okay? Or it can just be, be you yourself, okay? It's, in other words, the verb is going to be first person singular or plural in the subjunctive. Um, it's let's go get ice cream, okay? Let us get ice cream is what's going on there. Um, and in Greek, you, you put the verb in such a sentence in the subjunctive. In this case, 
it's going to be an error subjunctive. It's let's be getting ice cream to be literal minded if it's going to be a present subjunctive. All right? Um, that's one type of sentence in which you'd use uh, a subjunctive. You're, you're not stating a truth, you're urging people to do something. The second one is prohibitions, that is, negative commands, telling people not to do something, okay, instead of urging them on. Um, and in this case, the verb is always in the second person, singular or plural, and it's always aorist. So don't eat that ice cream. When you'd put the verb eat in the aorist subjunctive, and you'd use the negative me, right? Since it's not a true statement, you can't use ooh. And then finally, there are deliberative questions. Deliberative questions mean questions in which you're asking yourself, the speaker, um, what to do. Okay, should I or should we eat this ice cream? It can be either first person singular or plural. Um, and and uh, so it's a question in which the subject is I or we, and you're asking yourself the question. So let's look at a few simple examples in Greek. Um, Wait. These are these are the key things that are, that make these distinctive. One is that again to repeat that the subjunctives are the verbs of main clauses, not of dependent sentences. All right, like purpose clauses or conditions, which is what we've learned, where we learned to use subjunctives before. And you can't figure out how to translate these subjunctives until you figure out which of the three types it is. So when you see a subjunctive as the main verb of a sentence, you have to ask yourself: Is it a prohibition? Is it a, an exhortation, or is it a question, a deliberative question? All right, so here are our three examples. The hortatory one, the exhortation, you can put an exclamation point after it. Let's stop the battle, okay? Um, you're exhorting a group. Don't stop the battle, okay? Uh, again, telling people not to do something. A deliberative one, should we be stopping the battle? Am I, are we to stop the battle? That's another way, a kind of more archaic way of saying it. But mm -hmm. should we be stopping the battle is the regular one. So those are, that's a present subjunctive. It can be, the subjunctive in any of these can be present or errors, depending on what you want to do. Except for this one. All right. So this is unit six in Hanson and Quinn. Um, the last piece of grammar in it, is about how you express time, and the same thing as works for time, works for space as well, time or space in ancient Greek. Um, so, so what you you have is you don't you know we say on the fifth day or it, I'll be done with that in three days or stuff like that. We use prepositions to express the different kinds of time, so or do something for five days, but in Greek, you just use the cases with time words, okay? So so you have to be sensitive to what's a, a time or a space word unit. So so time, in other words, days or hours, or you can even say for a long time, okay? That's a time word, <laughs> the word time, okay? Often enough it's that. So you have to kind of recognize that you're seeing a time word and then say, oh, it's that case. It's not a direct object or an indirect object or something like that. It's a time expression, and it's a little bit tricky. The little light bulb has to go off again. So um, let's look at the three expressions. We use the, the, the visual from the book, which is quite nice, okay? A dot, a circle, and an arrow. <laughs> a dot is a point in time, okay? So it's one moment. That's the dative of time, on the fifth day. Um, a, a circle is kind of blobby, okay? Within five days, I'll get done with my thesis. Okay, right? You're you're just you know scatter shot. Okay, and the arrow is a, a space of time over which something will happen. For five days, uh, I was in the hospital. Right, stuff like that. So these are the three expressions, and these are the th ways you do it. Pente hemera, the date of time, on the fifth day. Pente hemeron, within five days. Pente hemeras, for five days. So it's all embedded in the case system. And, and the key thing is, a little light bulb goes off in your head. Oh, time words, okay? But it can be space as well. So you could, just like we have on the fifth day, it could be the, 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 this, um, a way of measuring distance in ancient Greek. Well, there's different things, but, but the most common one is what's called a stadion, where we get the English word stadium. 
it's a state. It's a it's as long as the running race was. So um, that's that's a measure of of distance. So you can say uh, uh, four or five stades um, within five stades, or or on the at the fifth stade from here, right? And do the same thing in the different cases. And it applies exactly the same way. All right. Thanks, Navy. Please move over a bit now into the picture. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at the vocabulary in Unit Six. This is on pages 150 and 151. I'm just going to kind of go through it and make some comments. The first word, ikes, igos, we've talked about before. Note that it can be either masculine or feminine. The other nouns that we've had that are like that are the word theos for god or goddess. Mm -hmm. Just change the article or the, the adjectives that agree with it. And hippos, the word for horse, right? Which can be a ha hippos, a stallion, or just a horse. and Or he hippos, a, a female horse, a mare, okay? Next word is a particle, a really good one, geh, okay? Um, we haven't taught you, it's a word without an accent that's in clitic, but it it's, tells you that it means at any rate, or at least it can also express irony, okay? And uh, it, it expresses, it, it comes after the word that it applies to. Um, we've put on the, on the blackboard there a few third declension nouns and their dative plurals. We talked about how these are formed. But there's gero, the word for old man. Its dative plural is gerusi. There's nux, the word for night. Its dative plural is nuxi. And pragma, pragmasi. Because the you look at the genitive, it's pragmatos. There's a T there. So when you add the T to the S, you get an S. Right? Mm -hmm. The T disappears. And soma, somasi, it's somatos, the same. And so forth. So make sure you understand how these are working. Helene, helese is another one. All right. Um, what other words have we got here? We've got the word gnome or gnomes, which means opinion or judgment. Uh, it comes from the same root as English no with a K, K-N-O-W, manifested as a gamma in Greek. There's denos, dene, denon, an adjective that means fearful as well as clever. Okay, that seems weird. But if you think about terrible, for example, you can say person's terrible or terribly clever. Mm -hmm. Right, you got things like that in English. Um, this is it's an adjective derived from an old word for fear. Um, more about that some other time. Doulos is the word for slave. Ancient Greeks had slaves. They had the worst kind of slaves, chattel slaves that you know people owned them and they never became adults. So the word for slave is either doulos or guess what, pais, the word for child, because because they never become fully adult. Um, they get sold and bought. Athenians were notorious for being un not not uh, mean enough to their slaves, according to people in other city states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were okay. So, but slaves did amazing things too. It's not really so simple. For example, uh, the main architect of the Parthenon was a slave. <laughs> you have the police force in Athens, such as it was the Scythians, they were slaves. And this is not our model. Right. But anyway, we, we, they're still slaves, and it's not good. So there, there's the word for slave, doulos, doulou, which is masculine. There's the word for slavery, douleia. That's a regular way of forming an abstract noun is with the suffix iota, alpha in Greek. There's a verb, douleo, which governs an object in the dative, to be a slave to someone. That's what goes in the dative. And it doesn't have a full set of principal parts. Do lao so do lao so and do lao come, but there's no perfect or error, perfect middle or error is pass, perfect middle passive or error is passive. You get the word for free to go with the word for slave um, and the word for freedom. So free is eleutheros. It comes from the uh, verbal root that means to go or come. So it's about yeah. originally about movement. Um, so, and, and they give you, they tell you that it goes with the genitive. So that's if you want to say free from something, the thing you're free from goes to the genitive case. Um, and notice it's a, it's an adjective whose final consonant is a row. So that means that it doesn't have any etas. It has long alphas. Um, um, and the, the, the abstract noun freedom is eleutheria, just like douleia with an iota eta. There is the word Helene, Helenos, which means a Greek, a Helene. We still 
that Greece in modern Greek is Hellas, okay, and the people are Hellenes. So, so this is still a word for for Greek and Greek. The word Greek comes from Latin Graecus, mm -hmm. um, word of rather obscure origins. It's, it has the form of a derogatory term. In other words, it looks like what the what the Romans called Greeks and they didn't like and mm -hmm. but, yeah. Weird. Yes, so you know, cultures have nasty words for ethnic groups that they they resent. <laughs> yes, that happened in antiquity. Anyway, so um, then there's the word elpis elpidos. We learned about the inflection of it, which means hope or expectation. For us, that's a good thing. And in ancient Greek mythology and texts, however, hope is something just el elusive and delusional mm. most of the time, and not a good thing. Uh, we get finally the preposition kata, which we have in all kinds of English words like catastrophe, catastrophe, and catatonic, and um, uh, cataclysm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're thinking of that. What are the words come to mind? Catalyst. Catalyst. There you go. Lots of Greek derivative words with kata in it, and it means under with a genitive and according to, or along as well, with the accusative. Okay. Um, both. You should add that meaning to what's given in the book. We get a, a one or two, let's see, we have three new verbs in this lesson. We get, and there are easy ones, they're verbs whose stem ends with a vowel. So there's koluo, not to be confused with keleo, very different, right? <laughs> koluo means prevent somebody from doing something. Um, its principal parts are very straightforward. You could guess them if I didn't tell you. It's just like luo, uh, politeo, which means to, that and koluo, by the way, means hinder or prevent. There's politeo, which means to live as a citizen, conduct the government, or in the passive, be governed. Okay, all those things are fine. <laughs> Principal parts, again, are just normal. Um, and finally, we get choreo down at the end of the list. That means to take part in a choral dance. Okay, more about that when we get there. Um, other words, we've got the relative pronoun, hos, he, ho. We've got the word for night, nux, nuctos, um, which we have... Cognates of the Latin word for night is the same root, so that's where we get nocturne and nocturnal. But the English word night comes from the same, uh, is the Indo European word for night derived from the same source as Greek nukes. There's palaios, palaia, palaion, an adjective of three genders that means old, ancient, or aged. We have in paleography and paleolithic and all those words. Um, pragma pragmatos, which means a deed, an affair, or a thing. It also means trouble sometimes, ta pragmata. We have English words like pragmatic that come from it. Um, it comes from the, a verb that means to do things. Prato, didn't we have it? Praso? Maybe um, not. I don't think so, not yet. Not yet. Um, we got the word for wise, safos, safe, safon, uh, another three termination adjective, and the, the abstract noun safia. So we're getting three examples so far of iota, alpha, abstract nouns, dulea, eleutheria, and sophia. Um, there's the word that's the standard measure of distance, stadion, stadiu, which is a neuter noun. and translates its state because we don't have anything that's the same. It says around 600 feet. And look at the plural of it. It's ta stadia or hoi stadioi. Um, this this kind of doubling is originally non-redundant. In other words, what the the neuter plural with an alpha originally means is a collection of states, a group of states. Whereas hoista dia just means a bunch of it means a sequence of them. So so for example, you have this in Latin. The word for place locus has two plurals, loci, which means a bunch of places, and loca, which means a region. Okay, so it's a collective versus a a plural. Soma somatos um, means a body, a physical body. It can be a corpse too. Um, what do we have? We have uh, somatic uh, as derivatives of this in English, um, stuff like that. Um, we get the, the conjunction te without any accent that means and. Um, in in, in it's very rarely all by itself in classical Attic Greek. You have a chi with it sometimes. So you have both and that are te and chi. So you say te, x, 
chi y. You put the first thing you're connecting after the te, and the second one after the chi. Or you can also do x te chi y. You can do it both ways. Just say both x and y. You can put the x, the first member of the pair, before the te, as well as after. So x te chi y. <laughs> okay? <laughs> exactly. So let's see, we also get the enclitic particle toy, which is the third of these. We've got ge and te, now toy. That means I'm looking you in the eyes when I'm saying this. <laughs> okay? And um, so the book also uses a word u-toy, okay? But it doesn't tell you about that it is in the dictionary. That's a combination of u and toy, okay, with an acute accent and a smooth breathing. That doesn't, that doesn't mean this. If you're looking it up in the dictionary, that, that word has an H. This is just really not. <laughs> not and I really mean it. Um, the, the next word in the vocabulary is phalanx, the word phalanx, which is a formation of hoplites. That's, that's, what, hap that's what you call a bunch of them going into battle, covering up over each other. Fulax, fulakos, we had the verb fulato derived from this, so this is a third declension noun. Um, charis charitas, the word for favor. Um, and notice that it has this really weird thing, that it can be a preposition. Well, it's really not a preposition, it's a postposition. It comes after the noun in the genitive case, that pre that, and it means because of, for the sake of. So there are most of the prepositions, in fact, all the ones we've learned so far, they have the preposition like n or a p or or so forth, and then you have the object after it with the with the preposition charin, which looks like a noun. Okay, you have the genitive before it, so it's an attempt to try and make it clear that it's not the noun charin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you got to watch out for that genitive and there's that that comes that precedes it. The last word is choros, choruha, which we translate dance or chorus. Um, it, it's important to understand that this is a social institution um, in ancient Greek life. Uh, it's a group of people usually of the same age. Perhaps there's a trainer who's older, or uh, but it's usually peers of the same age and gender who constitute a choros. And it's not dancing or singing. It's those two things together because the notion of music is Music uh, is this, what we call music, is only a piece of what Greeks call music. Music is words, um, dancing, and, and uh, singing, okay, singing and, singing and dancing together. So that's what a choros does. Um, and it's a, it's a social group. It's for various, has important social functions in Greek. So a chorautes is a person who dances in a choros, or sings, okay, it's not just dancing. Okay, and it's not just saying it's the two together. All right, that's it.